Welcome to Walnut Creek CERT and the Disaster Psychology Unit. As always, we ask you to um, keep in mind that as we are training any unit, we personal safety is our is always our number one priority. It's the first thing that we take care of, and you're going to see that this is particularly resonant in this unit today. Um, we always ask that you come to an activation or a training prepared. So you have protective equipment, you have water, you have whatever you're gonna need. Um, we always work as a team and we never go off on our own and do things on our own. We always maintain situational awareness and we employ a good size up, the cert size up process in order to assess where we are, assess what our options are and the implications of taking action and to form a cohesive plan based on what our resources are and to take action and then to continuously be aware of what we're doing with the intent that doing the greatest good for the greatest number of people is our uh, is our objective. So that's all of that is particularly relevant to the unit that we're going to be talking about now. So disaster psychology. We talk about disaster psychology because obviously in a disaster, um, we are going to likely have occasion to experience things that are unpleasant. We will come across uh, people who are injured, people who've experienced loss, things that are frightening, things that are upsetting, and how we and our team and survivors cope with all of that is what this unit is about. And what we're going to be talking about are tools to just fundamentally understand what it looks like from a psychological or a physical perspective when someone is experience extreme, experiencing extreme stress or trauma, how you can lay a foundation for yourself personally to be able to handle better trauma when it comes your way, and then how to support survivors and other CERT members who are experiencing stress and trauma. So we begin this unit by uh, asking people when we're in an in-class session, uh, if anybody's been involved in a, a disaster of any kind, and if they can relate to the psychological impact and the physical impact that happens when you experience trauma. And of course, trauma can come from situations other than a disaster, but we've all recently been through a pandemic. Some of us have experienced other earthquakes. Some of us have experienced terrorist events. So in some way, we can all draw on our personal experiences and just take a moment and think through, what did we experience physically? What did we experience emotionally and what was the impact on our lives? So some people who engage in response and rescue behaviors are energized by it. They find meaning in it and um, they do well uh, working through it, maybe having drawing on past experiences where they had strength during adversity. Most people feel some level of stress and difficulty related to the situations that we may be putting ourselves into as CERT. So let's talk a little bit about how, uh, what trauma is. So it's a response to something happening to us personally or something that someone else is experiencing that we are uh, absorbing. It might be a death. It might be a serious injury. Um, it, it, it could be loss of any kind, uh, any kind of uh, separation from family, from close relationships, from the things that we know that are a part of our everyday existence. It's a, it's a sometimes sudden threat to our everyday existence. And it can be very disruptive. 
just the fact that we don't know what might come next, the fact that something severe happened out of the blue creates in us a feeling of vulnerability and just that unknowing of what might happen next creates a lot of anxiety in in many humans. And whether that's happening to us personally, or whether we are working with team members or cert team members who are experiencing something or uh, victims that we come across, we can absorb those feelings and those impacts. There, there is a, sometimes a secondary or a vicarious traumatic uh, response to stress from, from first responders. And it can be as strong as uh, the, the actual person is experiencing the loss. You know, you're kind of living through what someone else is experiencing. And that can create burnout. It can sometimes create what they call compassion fatigue. So it's important that we are aware of what that means. So first, let's look at what people, what normal or typical human response is to stress. So Often humans will respond in one of these ways to an extremely stressful event. So they might freeze, you know, just be on guard, be unable to, to move, to be so frightened and so disrupted that they, they can't act. They might run. I knew somebody once who saw a child struck by a car and the child in response to that trauma jumped up and ran across the street, across traffic and across the street, that absolute trauma of of being injured created flight for that child. Um, A person might become combative to to a threat. They might uh, have strong feelings of of, uh, fright. And it's even possible for somebody to faint in the face of strong adversity or psychological or physical trauma. So so trauma can either affect us emotionally, it it can make us hyper, uh, give us, you know, deep feelings of unsettled uh, life, it can make us hyper on guard, it can make us feel helpless, it, it can affect our cognition. It may impair our ability to think through problems or to problem solve or to take envision next steps forward. And it can have spiritual implications to us, you know, creating a sense of, of a loss of hope. So what that looks like physiologically is are these items. So a person could have a loss of appetite. They might have uh, stomach or abdominal pain or symptoms. They might experience headaches or chest aches, uh, you know, physical muscular stress causing additional physiological symptoms. People can respond with an increase in the use of medications, whether that's alcohol or drugs, they might become hyperactive and seek to 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 engage in a lot of doing, uh, but without much productivity. It can affect sleep tremendously, and it can result in tremendous fatigue. So it's important to know those symptoms so that you can see if you can observe them in yourself, in your teammates, and in survivors that you come across. So it's important to know what we can do before we come into a situation of trauma during it or after in order to to have coping mechanisms so we're going to we're going to talk about that and it's it's important to think about these these well-being tools 
on two dimensions, both for yourself and for uh, as a certain team leader and as a as a t- team member, uh, you're going to want to be helping your teammates to cope during and after uh, a disaster. So, you know, these things that are on this page are very common. We see them all the time. Our doctors tell us about this. In order to have a, a strong foundation in our lives for being able to cope with whatever comes towards us, we want to have good balance. So we want to have good nutrition. We want to take care of our health. We want to exercise regularly. <clears throat> Sleep is is has become known in the last few years as a super important element of our well-being. And then also, as we found during the pandemic, our inability to connect with others is it can really impact our health and well-being and our stability. So it's important that we always maintain connections of one kind or another. There are many ways to connect with other humans and um, having spiritual resources. And that doesn't necessarily mean a religious affiliation, although it certainly can be. It, but some people gain a spiritual connection, being connected with nature, being connected outdoors, uh, ha- having some higher purpose. So those are the, the foundations that you're going to want to develop for yourself so that you can help others. And it's always important to have really good communication skills, to know, to, to understand yourself enough to know what you need and to be able to ask others, your family, your teammates, ask people for what it is that you need. So being aware of what can happen and, and what trauma looks like, and then understanding how it might impact you physiologically or psychologically is important. And then that communication element is important, being able to ask your family members, your friends, what you need, and and really with other people, not forcing them to talk until they are ready, or yourself not being forced to talk until you're you're ready. You can, you know, re-stigmatize somebody by forcing them to talk. So the self-care toolbox. This is a tool, and we'll just take a, a couple of minutes doing it on our own, but it's a it's a pretty simple tool that you can use to do, do an assessment of where you are in, in managing your own personal stability, your own preparedness to be able to walk into a situation and help others in a disaster. So if you look at the the self-care toolkit uh, grid, it, it lists those foundational elements that I talked about, nutrition, sleep, m- being able to manage work life, uh, balancing all of the elements of your life, how well you are at managing stress. Do you take time for enjoyment and for fun in life? Do you have some sort of a connection with other people one way or another? Um, and are you regularly getting exercise? Those foundational things that will provide you with the balance that you need in order to be able to help others. And it asks you to assess one through 10, one being very poor and 10 being excellent, how it is that you are on each of those scales. And then the exercise is to, to look at each one of those elements and to just pick one way that you can improve that element. Now that's, that's a lot of self development. So the other thing you can do is go through this exercise. It does cause you to reflect on how you live your life and how you would want to improve your overall, um, mental and physical well-being and, and just pick one thing or two things that you want to work on and improve. And then as those things improve, then you can take on other assignments. To, to make your life a little bit better. It's important working in a cert team that if you're in a leadership position, whether that's in the command post, in one of those incident command positions, or whether that is you're on a search and rescue team and you're the leader for that team, it's important to build into how you work with your teammates 
and and the people who are working with you uh, mechanisms to ensure that they are keeping pace emotionally and physically with the demands of the work. So that entails making sure that everybody is getting a chance to rest, making sure that workload is shared. This is one of the things when we go through CERT, it's important that we show up to help uh, increase the number of people who are trying to help the community following a disaster. The more hands there are working on somebody, the more we can distribute the workload. It makes it easier for everyone. Um, it, being the kind of leader who encourages people to talk about their experiences and uh, being a leader who themselves talks about their experiences, that normalizes the importance of communication and being able to de-stress by sharing your experiences with an, another human being. And, and it fosters this culture that says it's really important that as certs we share with one another, we are actively working on ways to de-stress ourselves and our, the team that we're working on. And a leader demonstrates the those behaviors themselves and makes sure that the team is properly hydrated, that they're taking their breaks, that you're rotating duties. Um, and, and it's important that you're, you know, there are some people that, that like to be super heroes and they want every shift and they want to keep coming back every single day. It's important that somebody is watching out and making sure that there are natural breaks in the work that our CERT volunteers are performing so that there is a, a good balance. And, and something to be cautious about when you're a leader in a CERT group is that, you know, it's good to take time after a shift to let everybody to settle out. You really want to be cautious about sending a worker home who has experienced something very traumatic, and then you're going to put them in a car and let them drive. They're going to be distracted. They're going to be emotionally upset. So it's a really good idea to take time to let the team settle down, to monitor, does somebody need a ride uh, is does somebody need to have a connection with a family member? You know, what is it we can do to help diffuse a situation when we know that a team member has been significantly impacted? Okay, these next two slides are about two very common um, tools that are used these days, often part of meditative practices that allow a person to recenter themselves when they, um, if you do so on a regular basis, small moments, various times during the day, you can focus on what you're feeling in your body, focusing on your breathing, allowing whatever is there to just be there, you know, investigating how your body feels and, and how you're reacting, and then just taking time to to be self-compassionate and to say, you know, this is how I'm feeling. I'm going to take time to feel this way. I'm going to recognize that, that I can help myself with my breathing and focusing on my breath. It's a great tool to use anytime uh, during the day. Creating a practice of it allows you in difficult times and stressful times and even in times when you're having physical trauma physical injury, you can call on these the RAIN practice in order to help you balance and be able to endure. Um, another practice that's often used is, is, is to use this stop mechanism. So you're experiencing something very, very strong that's creating stress, it's creating anxiety. Stop. Take a moment to be still. Sit up straight, you know, create kind of a mountain in, in, your, in your torso. Stand if you can. Take a few calm breaths. Just be aware of your breathing. Inhale. Have full exhalations. Sometimes you can put your hand on your abdomen 
and you can observe the breath going into the body. You can release the your abdomen and your breath so that it touches your hand um, so that you're focusing somehow on your breath, either in your nose or in the back of your throat or in your abdomen or your chest. And that process, being able to observe how your body is reacting, has a calming influence on how you can uh, proceed and how you can handle the next step of of whatever it is you're experiencing in your life. So these are just tools that we would like you to remember and think about practicing on a regular basis in times of stress so that you can certainly master pulling them out when you need them as a search when difficult things come along. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, the emotional phases of a, of a crisis. Um, and of course, you know, whenever... Um, training mentions phases, you always have to say, not everybody experiences all of these things. Um, it, you know, if you're not characterizing what's going on, it doesn't necessarily mean that, you know, something is, is being handled wrong. Everybody has a different emotional response to what's going on. Um, but if you, if you think about it, before a disaster, we're all sailing along in our lives. We're doing what we do and uh, all is going well. Then all of a sudden there's often some sort of a sudden change and you, you, your world is, is altered. You are no longer in control of, of certain elements. It, it can be very difficult when in the first moments following a disaster in the first period of time following a disaster to come to grips with things that not being in your control. And there are people who, um, who become so uh, caught up in some of these emotional phases that their ability to just plan the next step of, of one thing they might be able to do to make their situation for themselves or their family better might be impeded by these emotional phases. So it's a good idea to be able to recognize them, to be able to empathize with them and to, to look for them when you're working with survivors. So um, another phase is the impact phase. So something has happened, it creates confusion, it creates disbelief. You know, think about how you felt in the beginning stages of the pandemic. You just couldn't believe that there were some, there were services that were shut down, that there were fundamental supplies that were not available, that there wasn't an immediate medical solution. You, you know, your your faith in, in social infrastructure was impacted in some cases. So it, it creates a sense of, of disbelief. And if you add to that from an impact perspective, if it's a natural disaster and people are separated geographically from their families, they they might have tremendous anxiety until they're reunited, till they're able to account for everybody in their family. So if, impact of a disaster really has a strong effect on emotion. There is sometimes a heroic phase as a result of a crisis. So sometimes people are filled with adrenaline and they start this doing activity. Well, let me go and do this. And it feels like it's productive, but actually it can often be very unproductive. Sometimes it takes the form of altruism. It drives sometimes volunteerism, but people have to recognize that sometimes that is just a personal response to stress and it might be just postponing facing what is in front of us, the reality that's around us. Then often there can be a honeymoon phase. So government services start coming in, a community bonds, um, the, the, survivors begin to feel a little bit of relief related to some um, initial support that comes into their community. 
sometimes that optimism can be short-lived and <clears throat> it it sometimes distracts from thoughts about the longer term implications of a disaster and, or of the of the crisis but it is it's good to realize that this that if somebody has experienced crisis and they are in the honeymoon phase where things are looking up you have to recognize that 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 too might change that feeling might change disillusionment can can set in um you know how long is it going to take for me to put my life back how long is it going to take for there to be governmental support funding or uh, my insurance company to to come and look at my house and settle my claim about damages or you know how long is it going to take me to heal or my family member to heal so it, it, it it's very frequent that people can feel disillusioned as a result of a crisis that happens in their life and then there's the reconstruction phase so eventually over time little by little uh, people can begin to reconstruct their lives and it helps tremendously from an emotional perspective you know sometimes throughout these processes people's hope and their emotional support for themselves and for their family and for people they know or they work with has has just become overwhelmed and they may be exhausted by all of that but eventually little by little people begin to re-examine their priorities they begin to find bits of recovery and that can help with the crisis so traumatic crisis is an event experienced or witnessed and it impacts people's ability to cope and and it makes them overwhelmed by either a death or a very serious injury or destruction of home community loss of family um, loss of 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 what was normal and as we talked about it can affect how we think and our ability to take action it can have physical implications and it can it can be difficult to maintain interpersonal relationships when we are experiencing traumatic stress and people who have experienced crisis or stress in their lives sometimes have a better ability to deal with the next crisis event that comes forward uh, of course things that uh crisis that happens that is extremely intense can create extreme disruption and everybody is going to be different in how they feel or they view about they view an event and these impacts of traumatic stress can happen immediately or they can creep up and they can happen over over time months and years so our job is to try and help stabilize survivors as best we can so the first thing we can do is we can recognize what it is we're seeing we should be observing the survivors that we're working with and looking for those behaviors those those psychological tips those physiological tips that are telling us that this person is struggling with uh, with a crisis um we can uh, we we have to watch for people who might be a uh, danger to themselves or to others and of course we want to let professionals um, EMS or professional first responders know if we see somebody that we think that is a threat there are things that we can do to um, you know certainly we're trained in basic first aid and getting someone in a crisis having physical injury addressed that helps them uh, stabilize themselves and feel more comfortable. And of course, it's important to provide support just by listening. And sometimes, you know, and we're going to talk in a few minutes about how to talk to somebody 
who is experiencing crisis, but sometimes just being there, being a, a willing person to sit with another human is, is a tremendous value. You know, we say in CERT that there are roles for everybody in CERT, regardless of what your physical capabilities are. And this is an excellent uh, uh uh, spot, an excellent task for people with mobility problems who might just be able to sit with a survivor and and give them comfort by just simply being there and being an empathetic listener. And of course, finding ways to uh, engage survivors with their family members, with their friends, with, with a sense of community. And even, you know, there may be people, if they are disruptive, if they're manifesting their crisis and their stress with disruptive behavior, there are things that we can ask them to do, small tasks that might be distracting to them, might get them caught up into some different kind of a, a pattern. So you might ask somebody who is being disruptive to organize something or to uh, set up chairs or or something that gives that distracts them, gives them something physical to do that that distracts them a little bit from disruptive behavior. So psychological first aid, we, we, we spent two units talking about medical first aid, mechanical body first aid. Now we're going to talk about psychological first aid. And the three ba basic components of that are listening to what people say without judgment, without imposing our own thoughts about what should be or how they should feel, um, you know, helping survivors to feel uh, protected. And we're going to talk about how we can do that. Um, by by communicating with them, giving them honest answers, speaking with them in very straightforward ways so that it doesn't appear as if we're hiding anything, and then um, connecting them with others, whether that's somebody in their family or just whomever we can provide to them now. So let's talk about the skills of being an empathetic listener, because that's that's a really critical um, skill for all of us to develop. So of course, putting yourself in someone's shoes is an, is a way to, to think about being empathetic, but, but more importantly, it's, it's trying to listen to what people are trying to tell you, not necessarily focusing on their words. You know, they might have body language that suggests how they're feeling. They might not be able to, um, express effectively what they're feeling, but you can tell uh, by just listening to somebody, listening to how they're speaking to understand how it is they might be feeling. Um, and you can always uh, paraphrase and tell someone what you think you heard them say. So um, what that looks like when we're um, working with a survivor is we, we certainly don't want to shift the conversation to us. We don't want to say things like, you know, oh, this happened to me and I understand completely what you're feeling. But the fact is we, we never know what somebody else is feeling. And the minute we say the word I, it takes away from what that person is feeling and it sort of invalidates how they are feeling. So we don't want to impose on them. You should be feeling this way. You should look at your circumstances this way. We, we, we should just listen and, and empathize. And if we say some of these things and we realize it, please don't, don't hesitate to apologize. Just say to the person, you know, you're, you're right. I, I shouldn't have said that, um, you should don't oh don't cry. I, I shouldn't have said that. I apologize. And instead, what we should be focusing on is is just expressing sorrow, expressing you know reiterating what the person said to you to affirm what they said, and see if there's anything that 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 person can communicate that they need or we can do for them. Even if it's just giving them some water or if it's giving them some space, or it's giving them a person who's just going to sit with them. So again, really important that certs take care of our teams, that we create a culture where we're constantly talking about what we're seeing, what we're experiencing, <clears throat> what the impact is having on us, so that it makes it normal for us to talk that way and to, to know how one another is doing. And 
of course, doing all of those, those healthy habits on a regular basis, getting sleep, getting good nutrition, getting exercise, taking time to calm and yourself, taking time to, to, in, to experience joy, uh, being mindful of your body and your emotions. All those things lay a foundation for us to have effective team members when we go out to help others. Of course, in the course of our work in a disaster, it is possible that we will come upon a person who is dead, who is dying, um, or, or a person who has died. <clears throat> your, your local, every CERT's local municipality may have protocols related to handling um, uh, what to do when there is a dead body. But for the most part, what we want to do is simply cover the body, be respectful of it, be respectful of family members and friends, and um, we should notify authorities. We never want to move asserts. We never move a dead body. Um, we we When we come upon it, because we have to recognize it could be a crime scene, um, certainly, if we've set up a medops tent and there is a death in the middle of our medops area, um, we we may just want to move that uh, move a dead body to the outskirts to a, a separate area so that we we set up a morgue uh, away from people that we are caring for. But um, just know it's important. We don't proclaim death. We don't uh, announce anything. Um, we just cover the body and we make sure nobody touches it or becomes, you know, uh, disturbs the area. And um, we try and take care of the survivors. And it's been said that people who... Um, can think of something good after a disaster, uh, have a, a better chance of recovering in the long term if they can realize that there was some small grain of something that came out that made them stronger. Whether it's, you know, you realize how much you love your family or your friends or how much uh, you appreciated something, um, that helps you with your own recovery. So, in summary, it's important to get yourself ready. Things will happen in a rescue situation that will be uncomfortable, unpleasant, traumatic. Make sure you know what it looks like when you or others are experiencing psychological or physical trauma. Think through what it looks like when people are going through the phases of a disaster. Um, and recognize, try and recognize when you see it in yourself or in others. Take time to work as a team, to de-stress, to manage yourselves together as a team, to make sure that you're, you're providing respite, that you're creating a space where people can talk about how they're feeling and what they're experiencing. Try and stabilize survivors as, as best possible use listening skills, make sure that people feel protected and connected. And, um, and that is what we can do to help with trauma. Thank you very much for your time.